Welcome to my podcast, Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. I'm so excited you are here. You will hear some incredible stories about how people are serving around the world, how they overcame a struggle, how they serve. These shows will give you an edge in business and your personal life. I believe serving over sales will help you grow in so many ways. And now, about our incredible sponsor, Info. Info is a web app that puts your business on people's cell phones when you meet people online or in person. They can engage with your business or send out referrals with a button click 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The power of business is connecting with more people. Remember, your network is your net worth. Info will do this for you. I would love to help spread the word about these shows, so please subscribe to this podcast and find us on all your podcast platforms. Please share with anyone you know who could benefit from our shows. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. And I've got a retired gentleman here that's still serving in his retirement years. So you retirees out there, I want you to listen. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. He's out of Canada, so we call this our international show. Not really, because it's not that far, right? Oh, it's not that far, but right now it's freezing rain. Not good. I'm looking out the window, and all the trees are covered with ice. <laughs> I love it. What I love about you, John, and, and really caught my ear when I first met you was you're still busy when you're retiring. you got projects you're working on. What's one of the projects you're passionate about? that you're doing well first of all when i i was a futurist for national defense and in the mid 2000s we were seeing that there's soon going to be more people over 65 than under 50 unprecedented demographic change always and everywhere the age pyramid is few elders many young now we're getting it to be like more elders than young and so i started thinking and we're living longer, weller, right? So I, I thought it's not retirement anymore. It's amateurment. Hmm. You can reach a level where you at least have independent means like the gentlemen of old days. And now to be an amateur is to pursue what you love. And I think we're entering into, you know, the baby boomers, unprecedented time in history this massive of skilled of educated you know experienced um people and if we have the right social conditions these elders will be you know have the means to sort of not starve there's a there's the gray boom right the the, the activists mm -hmm. right so right now i'm pursuing a a master's in uh, in philosophy economic uh, philosophical economics because i'm very interested in modern monetary theory guaranteed job uh, acid based community development and i just applied i'm co-founder of the space and i just applied to be on the board of a community um hub you know an old high school that is that is now being transformed to host nonprofit organizations to, to serve the community. And I'm still the, um, involved in my local community where I manage a listserv. You know, it's just, a, you know, when we, we produce a, a little newsletter and we produce about 1,500 of these newsletters because there's about 750 households in the community. And the listserv now is about 1,200 people. Right. You're, you're so busy, but you said a magical word, I think, is passion, which runs across retired or not retired, right? You're finding uh, passion and stuff, more time to I, do it. I think, um, again, when I one of the reasons I'm co-founders of the space, right? When I worked as a futurist for national defense, I did a lot, you know, what's the future of work? What's the future of identity? And... Anything that can be automated will be. That doesn't mean everything's going to be automated tomorrow. But if it can be automated, it will be. And what we're seeing with AI in this last couple of years, 
it's pretty unprecedented what can be automated. The other thing is, so that means what is work becoming? Well, humans are good at the non-routine. <laughs> yeah. That's right? Sure. And when you think about a union who wants to make a, you know, like who has, you know, like in, you know, like a conflict with management, they will first work to rule. We're just going to follow the rules. And why is that a threat? Because most of the time, organizations work not just because people do the rules, but they're constantly figuring out, oh, how I do this? How do I do this? How do I, you know, we're always have a slice of improvisation mm -hmm. that's making things work, right? Yep. And so the future is really about how do we educate citizens to be curious? How do we awaken our curiosity? Right. Because, you know, Marshall McLuhan said, we're, we're now in an age where we have to learn a living. Mm. Right. So we all know we've heard lifelong learning, but it's more than lifelong learning. We need now educational institutes that are free for our whole life. Because if it can be automated, that means I may have to recalibrate not just my job, but my career. Yeah. Right. I remember when I started work in the government, there weren't any computers. I was given a blank desk. I didn't even have a phone and a pad of paper and a pencil. Right. Three years later, everybody had a computer on their desk. <laughs> right. How do you train a typing pool to be IT support? Right? <laughs> you know, how do you train officers who are used to going to the typing pool to do their own keyboarding? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so the need to awaken curiosity feeds what Daniel Pink talked about in Drive. The difference between extrinsic motivation mm. and intrinsic motivation. People, you know, you, you have, they did this experiment, a uh, class of kids, and they give them crayons and paper. Right? Everybody's drawing pictures. They divide the class into two. They start paying one half they start paying the kids to draw pictures. The other half, they just, you know, they just draw pictures. The kids that are getting paid soon stop drawing pictures unless they're getting paid. Mm. The kids who aren't getting paid, they continue to, because they're enjoying drawing pictures. And so, although we've got this culture of um, productivity and our, you know, the sort of the neoliberal economic framework believes that you know everybody has to have an incentive we have to shape these incentives and we shape these external rewards to incentivize us mm -hmm. if we're going to be able to learn to man you know learn learn a living we need to be intrinsically motivation that motivated yep. <laughs> i remember at work a new piece of software and hearing myself go Oh, I don't want to learn something new. And then all of a sudden, what did I just say? Oh my God, I can't believe I said I don't want to learn something new, right? I, what I, I didn't want to be driven to learn something, right? Yeah. But I do want work conditions. And, I, and again, I think I've just pretty sure I've, diagnose you know i've done a self-diagnosis and i'm will start the process that i have adhd right adult adhd and so it's easy for me to sort of go from project to project to project but um so uh, now I feel like I've just talked myself into a corner here. <laughs> no, you're you're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, even even to do long term work, you know, to to like Michelangelo, he had to also sand that damn David, right? Like that's no fun. Yeah. Hours and hours of sanding. 
So unless you've got this passion and this curiosity, it's really hard to do the dog work. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, there's nothing wrong with um, extrinsic reward, but we really need to, you know, create conditions where people can follow a career path um, that includes, that honors, that embraces the need for intrinsic motivation. I enjoy the act of doing this, right? Yeah. And so for me, that's a huge component of the future of work. The huge component of of um, the um, ability for a population, you know, in, not just to pursue the passions, but to deal with our challenges, right? Right. Ongoing education is something you said, which we all yes. know, but you, you're living it because you just told me and told us in the audience that you're getting your master's at your retirement age. I was working on a PhD, but it was for a religious organization who decided that they want to close the school and sell the building. So I was faced with, I can't do a PhD in the, in the three months, you know, but I can do a 50 page, 60 page research paper and I've done all the coursework so I can get a master's for, from it, right? The, the importance for me was not so much the degree, but the, I, I'm a high school dropout, right? I dropped out of high school, I became a hippie. I was 26 years old when um, the only jobs I could get were literally digging a ditch or, you know, <laughs> emptying a train car load of bags of cement. Nothing worse than concrete snot at the end of the day. So I heard this voice that said, John, if you're going to be happy, you need a life work. And then if, you, if you're going to have life work, you better get an education. So at 26, I went to the local college. I did grade 12 equivalency. I did a year of college. Life happened. I ended up back in Ottawa. And that's when I started a BA in psychology. I got an honors BA, and then I did an MA. And, you know, I, I did an MA in th anthropology. Like, how am I going to get a job? <laughs> No yeah. one is going to give a master's degree in anthropology job. But look, I did a stats course, did really well, and that got me a job in the government. Look at that. Right? That is, I like it. You know, and so um, this, and I think it's really good. I think kids should not go to university right after high school. You know, there are some kids who really, they know, right? But for the majority of people, they really need to sort of get out and work and live. And, you know, and, and I mean, so for me, I really learned <laughs> what work was, right? I learned what, um, you know, a sort of discipline and, he, you know, and in that, I really sort of also learned one of the things that happened to me, I think the most important lesson I learned in becoming a hippie was learning to do nothing. Interesting. Right? All those voices, oh, you should do this. Oh, you should do that. You know, by learning to do nothing, I saw all of a sudden I started hearing my voice, right? Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. And I think, you know, this sort of the gap year, or if we had, you know, I think there used to be a sort of a civil, um, like a civil force type, you know, do, work for, for society, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of stuff. I think that gives young people a chance to sort of, you know, have, sow seeds, have lots of experiences, but begin hearing their own voice. 
and and it gives them options too because when i was a kid and you were a kid that's all people did is you could go i didn't go to college until i was 45 so i followed the same path yeah. but i like what you're saying we, let's give them choices go to civil or do a job or go to college you know you start paying them to go to college and they're not ready or don't want to yeah. that's a waste of money college is not cheap nowadays as we know well it, again i've Everyone has to become literate in modern monetary theory. Any country that issues their own currency can never run out of that currency. How to pay something, you know, what happens, you know, when the government spends, it doesn't use tax dollars. It says, go to that computer, type in these numbers to appear in that account. Taxes are what make us have to get currency, right? The British, they did this, you know, they were... They went to Africa and they wanted to do these things. Oh, my goodness, these natives, they seem to be lazy. Well, they weren't lazy. Why would they work for them when they can grow their own food, they have their own thing, and they have a good life? So the British imposed a hut tax. All of a sudden, everybody's unemployed. Hmm. They have to figure out, what, where do I get? Because the hut tax could only be paid in pounds. Where do I get pounds? Oh, the British comes. We're building a road here. We'll pay in pounds. Plus, pounds are now, you know, will become legal tender. All debts, public and private. So we need the pound in order to pay our taxes. The tax, so the government spends first, then takes the currency out of the, out of out of the economy by taxing. Taxes do other things too. When you hear government deficit. You should also hear double entry bookkeeping, private sector surplus. If the government has put this money in the economy and hasn't taken it all back, where did it go? It's in the private sector. Government debt is all that money that's been spent in the economy, that's circulating in the economy mm -hmm. that the government is accountable for. It doesn't have to pay it back. If it pays it, if it redeems, then there's no currency in the economy. So when we understand our collective power in our government, of and for and by, I'm a Canadian, but I love of and for and by, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a beautiful document. Right. Then that's our collective power to invest in ourselves, in our infrastructure, in, you know, as long as there's resources available, people available and capacity, the government can always afford to invest. So, sorry, yeah. that was a long thing, but this is really important because we have to reimagine this world. Climate change is here and we have, and that's a crisis of consciousness. We're one species on one earth. Yep. Right. We, we got to get rid of this problems with Nate, you know, it's good to have cultures and diversity, neurodiversity, all of that, but we got to be, we got to work together. Amen. Sorry. That's a nice long rant about this is why I'm doing the masters and modern monetary theory. Cause there is so much we need to, to the infrastructures we need to solve our problems. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When we make education expensive, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Who's going to be our future doctors and lawyers and engineers and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a shortage. Shortage is not good in the in, in the economy or in the industries. It just doesn't help. There are there are natural shortages, right? You have a see, this is a, again the notion of the creative commons. If you've got an apple and I eat your apple. You're diminished. Mm -hmm. That's a material good. That's called a rival good, right? And in rival goods, you can have a zero-sum game. Oh, but you've got a book. And I read your book. Well, you still own the book. But now the book is more valuable because both of us know what's in the book. And now further, you and I can talk about that book and gain new insights. Mm -hmm. That's called a non-rival good. And so information knowledge the more it's shared literally increases in value exponentially so this this notion of un you know un sort of 
when copyright was invented, right, created, yep. it was to break the power of the publisher. It was for 14 years. The creator had one chance for another 14 years. That was it. Okay, that's sort of fair. Um, but now it's like 70, 80 years after the death of the creator. Well, you know, it's mostly big companies that are, yeah. you know, this I is know. not. So the creative commons is our common wealth. Imagine if every word was copyrighted. <laughs> We'd have a we, problem. We'd be saying no and yes, maybe. Yeah. Well, you mentioned books. Let's talk about some, you know, a book that you have learned from that the audience can learn from. Oh, my goodness. Um, there are so many. Um, you know, one book is a, a very new book, uh, L. Randall Ray, How to Make Money Work for Us. And it's a it's a clearest articulation of modern monetary theory. Um, another book that I think is really accessible that's just been published. And for anybody, it's called The Dawn of Everything. Hmm. Um, and, and this is by uh, two people, David Wengro, who's an archaeologist, and David Graber who's an anthropologist. Now, David Graeber is the guy who coined, we are the 99%, right? Uh, his, his, he's written a bunch of books and I've read them all. Really good one is Debt, The First 5,000 Years, where I know it's a non sequitur. I'm getting to the book, The Dawn of Everything. In The Debt, The First 5,000 Years, I learned that the Indo-European word for sin, for guilt, and for debt is the same word. Mm. Now, I, I was born a Catholic, and to tell you the truth, I never really got original sin. But once I started realizing, oh, forgive me my sins, oh, forgive me my debts, we are all born in original debt. The parents who gave us life, the culture that gave us the tools, the languages and tools, that the, the, the environment of possibilities that we're born into that allow us to be who we are. It's a debt we can never repay. And even, you know, yeah. the life we have, right? So that that's a really interesting frame. So back to... The Dawn of Everything, I think it's a big book, it's 500 pages, but it is the summation of the state of the art of what we know in anthropology and archaeology. There is no linear path from hunter-gatherer to, you know, industrial. Um, one of the favorite facts I like is, you know, the Jesuits came to North America. And they wrote down the accounts from the Northeast natives who were criticizing the Europeans. Now, the Northeast, Northeast indigenous population, they had chiefs, but no one was required to listen to the chief, right? It's a sort of like uh, the anarchy, which is not no rules, it's no rulers. Mm -hmm. right? So the Europeans read the Jesuit accounts of the these indigenous populations critiques of of Western society. Now who do you think read that? Jean Jacques Rousseau. Right? Jean Jacques Rousseau in the social contract wrote that's the general will of the people that is sovereign. Mm. Now this is 1769, right? before the Declaration of Independence, before the rise of democracy. He was influential for that whole thing and on the founding fathers of America. So, you know, these critiques of the indigenous population went to the West, got sort of reappropriated and repackaged and influenced the founding fathers to, you know, to now... They're not, you know, they're, you know, like all human populations, you know, the indigenous population is a diverse. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So the the northwest, they had as many slaves as maybe Athens or the antebellum south, right? But not in the northeast. In the the, the you know the southwest again very different. So I find this is when I started studying psychology, I thought, oh, I'm learning about people. And then I started studying anthropology and I realized, oh, a lot of the psychology I'm really, is this, you know, normative Western culture? That anthropology is really, lets us know the human condition and the whole possibilities we have for creating culture and social structure and, you know, good and bad that we're not that there isn't a natural order that there's a created order right i love this stuff this is great knowledge and man i can listen to you all day i've <laughs> learned so much in just this short time we'll run out of time i want to thank you for being on the show oh. but i i do want you to shout out how people could reach out to you if they have questions about all the information you gave um well i i'm on twitter um you know at john verdun a lot of people confuse me with the mystery writer john verdun (laughs) Uh, and i don't have a profile picture but i have a little symbol of pluto right gotcha uh i have my email john verdun at gmail.com uh i do have a little blog um that i i'm sort of (laughs) Not really attending, but and sort of going to seed. But I've got some nice pieces of writing there. Um, yeah. uh, the wealth of the wealth of people um, is where I I've uh, produced sort of a lot of pieces. Um, I guess that's about it. I'm yeah. I'm I'm hoping you know that uh, I'm hoping myself to sort of stretch into a um, you know. Um, at the community hub where, you know, where I'm sort of getting involved, we're looking at wanting to set up a community podcasting studio where, you know, anybody with an interest group or anybody with a sort of a passion can sort of learn and produce that sort of thing. Um, um yeah, that's going to be a great tool. We talked about them before the yes. show. I think you're offering something pretty fantastic there. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't speak so much about the space. This, If I can just give a, yeah, go a ahead. little shout yeah, out for that. Absolutely. Because the space, my daughter is 30 years old and she's on the autism spectrum. You know, uh, developmental delay, otherwise unspecified. She's this beautiful, lovely, innocent, you know, 30 year old, but it's like a, you know, like a child and, but she's, you know, wonderful. And, you know, um, and the school system was great in Canada, like, you know, really, but after school, after high school, there was nothing. And, and um, so her caseworker and I, we started talking about, how society has divided us. We've got productive spaces and we have socializing spaces. But autistic people, they don't go and socialize, right? So this, can can we go on? This is going to be a little bit longer. But yeah, we got about a couple important. more minutes. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So um, the best party I ever went to was a Ukrainian egg painting party. They said, come to the party. We were drinking wine and they had a table set up and we paint eggs. And it was like, oh, my God, why can't we socialize and do be productive? Why have we said, you know, so we conceived of a social studio where people with neurodiversity could come and be social and creative and productive and learn how to use these tools. Now, you know. That's a little bit more of a challenge because autistic people aren't that social. It takes time for them to presence and get used to and it takes longer for them to learn. But we've been going six years now wow. and we're seeing that they're developing their friendships, right? They like each other. They're now, they come in and they know what they want to do, right? And Ryan, who's the creative director and does everything, 
you know, he's there. So this, how do I do this? And this to me is like the future of work, right? This is the, this most, because everyone can create value, right? right? Yeah. So no, it's um, really good. I have them reach out to you about the the space. You know, you heard his email. It'll be in the show notes. Reach out to him. You have questions. He'll tell you where it's at. We'll get the website in there. You can look it up. But let's leave the audience with some advice. I know you give a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. But what's one thing that's helped you in your journey to retirement that could help our, my audience in their journey? Well, you know, we talked about passion and we talked about my hippiedom. Let me just share my oldest daughter, right? I've been a long distance father with my oldest child. I've been an absent father with my second oldest child. Now all my children love me and I'm so privileged. I ended up with a phone call. She's on the plane, which meant she was leaving her mother and she's coming to live with me. And she stayed with me, but left at 60. I get a call from her. I think she's 17. She's in Vancouver. She says, hi, dad. Da, da, da. Oh, I'm doing sex work. She's a phone sex operator. You know, you're, I'm hurt. I think the wisest thing I ever did is that I didn't judge that. I said, hmm, you know, you're seeing an aspect of, of humanity that not a lot of people see. You should write a book. Well. She did 25 interviews with other sex phone sex operators. She decided, oh, I, don't, I need to know more. She went to college to learn more. Long story short, she ended up getting a PhD from the London School of Economics. And she's now the director of the social media, you know, uh, media studies at the London School of Art, London University of Arts. And so what I did in that is I, I didn't judge her decision. I aimed to see the possibilities of her decision. And I think if we can do that to ourselves and our children, that's a good thing. 